Uh, next up, let's go ahead and get into this uh, topic today. This is a, a complicated thing. I've gone on the record with my thoughts about things like children, suicide rates, bullying, children killing themselves and each other in our school systems, and a lot of the other problems that people seem to think are all different problems in the commonality of the problem. And I've said some things I think we can do to help, and I do think those things can help. And I, I want to be clear when I say that, like, this can be a solution that we're talking about today. There's many solutions to a problem, but I think we should all focus on the ones that we can actually do something with and the ones that have the greatest long-term potential. So let's start out with a question. I think it's a very fair question. Can we really solve all the world's problems in a garden? That's what Jeff says in one of his videos. He said, we can do this. We can solve all the world's problems in a garden. And of course, you got the British accent, so it sounds really cool and all. But even I balked at that statement a bit at first. And Jeff, again, is one of my greatest mentors. I've learned so much from the man. I'm so eternally grateful to him for what I've learned from him and for the work he's done. He's done work, relief work. The man's in his 60s, his late 60s. He's still traveling all over the world doing relief work in dangerous places. This guy's a solid dude. But when he said that, I kind of balked at it. Like, that's a bit of an overstatement. Like, that was one of those things that sounded good as a soundbite, but it's it's not really a, a, a thing. And I said, well, you know, metaphorically, yeah, I guess I understand where he's coming from. And when I looked at Deeper, I said, you know, he's serious. He he He's absolutely dead serious with this statement. And when I, when I realized that, I realized you had to look at it through the right lens. In permaculture, we talk about the permaculture lens. And I think learning to look through a specific lens uh, at a problem or a solution or uh, a thing or a pattern or what have you is very important. And no one thing is generally sufficient to fix any major problem. So a true solution is one that sets things in motion. And it's the initial motion that creates inertia and provides an opportunity for more things to be done and in the end, the problem's either solved or mitigated as much as can be done at the time. So true solutions are a catalyst. They're a spark of a solution. They create, they create something akin to a trophic cascade. What is a trophic cascade? It's when a small change creates powerful indirect interactions that can control or change an entire ecosystem. And a classic example is what happened in Yellowstone when the wolves were reintroduced. And what I'd like to do, because it, it's so powerful of a story, and it's so concrete of a real example of this thing, this trophic cascade, I'd like to play that for you right now. There's a link in the show notes to see the actual video, which does add something to it. And let me just say, if there's anything in the world of nature that is more primal and moving than the howl of a wolf pack... I have yet to hear it. One of the most exciting scientific findings of the past half century has been the discovery of widespread trophic cascades. A trophic cascade is an ecological process which starts at the top of the food chain and tumbles all the way down to the bottom. And the classic example is what happened in the Yellowstone National Park in the United States when wolves were reintroduced in 1995. Now, we, we all know that wolves kill various species of animals, but perhaps we're slightly less aware that they give life to many others. Before the wolves turned up, they'd been absent for 70 years, that the numbers of deer, because there was nothing to hunt them, had built up and built up in the Yellowstone Park, and despite efforts by humans to control them, they'd managed to reduce much of the vegetation there to almost nothing. They'd just grazed it away. But as soon as the wolves arrived, even though they were few in number, they started to have the most remarkable effects. First, of course, they killed some of the deer, but that wasn't the major thing. Much more significantly, they radically changed the behavior of the deer. 
The deer started avoiding certain parts of the park, the places where they could be trapped most easily, particularly the valleys and the gorges. And immediately those places started to regenerate. In some areas, the height of the trees quintupled in just six years. Bare valley sides quickly became forests of aspen and willow and cottonwood. And as soon as that happened, the birds started moving in. The number of songbirds and migratory birds started to increase greatly. The number of beavers started to increase because beavers like to, to eat the trees. And beavers, like wolves, are ecosystem engineers. They create niches for other species. And the dams they built in the rivers um, provided habitats for otters and muskrats and ducks and fish and reptiles and amphibians. The wolves killed coyotes. And as a result of that, the number of rabbits and mice began to rise, which meant more hawks, more weasels, more foxes, more badgers. Ravens and bald eagles came down to feed on the carrion that the wolves had left. Bears fed on it too, and their population began to rise as well, partly also because there were more berries growing on the regenerating shrubs. And the bears reinforced the impact of the wolves by killing some of the calves of the deer. But here's where it gets really interesting. The wolves changed the behavior of the rivers. They began to meander less. There was less erosion. The channels narrowed. More pools formed. More riffle sections, all of which were great for wildlife habitats. The rivers changed in response to the wolves. And the reason was that the regenerating forests stabilized the banks so that they collapsed less often, so that the rivers became more fixed in their course. Similarly, by driving the deer out of some places and the vegetation recovering on the valley sides, there was a soil erosion because the vegetation stabilized that as well. So the wolves, small in number, transformed not just the ecosystem of the Yellowstone National Park, this huge area of land, but also its physical geography. I know I've actually put that in the air on the air before, and I know that it's been shared like a gazillion times on social media. Many of you have heard it before, but I thought it was important to listen to it again in regards to how this type of a solution, growing children in our garden, can actually solve problems like teen suicide rates and bullying and other things like that. Before I get into kind of what I think children learn from gardening and how that can do some of this stuff, I, I would just like to point something out. Let's say that we all got together before this trophic cascade of these wolves happened. And we all decided there was an environmental problem in the Yellowstone Valley. There was too much erosion on the rivers. Too much biodiversity had been lost uh, in, in the birds and things like that. And we, we just looked through all the things that we just heard that changed for the better, and, including maybe overpopulations of deer and deer surviving that probably shouldn't survive uh, creating problems for their species as well. And we looked at the totality of the problem, which would have been massive. The river is not where it should be. That's how, you think about that, that's how big the problem is. And people said, well, I know, let's fix it. You, you, you know, let's build a dam, let's put in gabions, let's do, I mean, let's do earthworks. Let's, and, and imagine in this, this, you know, all these people, well-intentioned people saying all these huge changes to make. If one guy stuck his hand up and said, I know what we should do. And everybody listens like, okay, maybe he's got a good idea. And he says, I think we should just get a few uh, different packs of wolves and just put them in Yellowstone and make sure they're protected and let them go. And all of this will change for the better. What would any person using common sense at the time have probably said? It's too simple. It can't be that easy. There might be some good from it. You would have heard how there would be bad from it. Blah, blah, blah. You're wrong. But if you actually think about the fact that the Yellowstone ecosystem didn't change 
so much is return to what it was before the wolf went away. The most common sense and logical thing that you could have done was what they did. And it's not why they did it, by the way. They did it because, oh, the wolf's gone, so we should put the wolf back. And, and you know, we need more wolves and things like that. That's why they did it. They didn't do it to create this, but yet this one small thing. And I know I'm going to hear from people that are ranchers in Wyoming and Montana and all about how horrible is the wolf has been reintroduced. Look, I'm not opposed to wolf hunting. Okay, I'm not opposed to population control, especially off Yellowstone, especially on your ranch. That's irrelevant to what happened here. Don't get sidelined with you know your, your pet issue. The point is, putting a few big, giant, wild dogs into a park changed the course of a river and increased the biodiversity on Im- unimaginable levels from, from vegetation to animal and everything in between. And the riverbanks are more stable. And the erosion is reduced. Which means not only did it change Yellowstone, but the quality of the water leaving Yellowstone and going elsewhere is better because of a few wild dogs. So think about that as I talk about all the things that children learn when we teach them something as simple as how to garden. Okay, so let's talk about what happens when a child learns about gardening. And I'll tell you that A big part of who I am goes back to me being a small boy, first in Florida, mainly with my grandmother, and and learning to plant plants. And I I remember being like, once I learned from her, like we lived in this apartment complex, we had this sandy soil and all, but I remember planting popcorn along the wall outside of our apartment. I actually successfully grew popcorn, and I planted carrots under the popcorn, and those grew, and they did really good in that sandy soil. And, you know, I had this little garden as a kid with no one actually telling me what to do because I'd already learned from her. And then when we moved to Pennsylvania, I've talked about it many times, but I tended my grandfather's garden for about four years for him because he couldn't really do it anymore. And it's changed who I am forever. I can never go back and unchange myself, the positive things that that brought to me. So think about that too, and along with this trophic cascade concept as we go through these things that children learn in a garden. First and foremost, they learn patience. And I I think that we've lost, those of us that are older, we've lost how important that lesson really is in our children because we think of it the way it was when we were kids. I mean, you think of taking a little kid fishing or something, you throw the bobber in, and he's like, ah, we're not going to catch a fish yet. And it's been in the, it's like the, the bait hasn't even sunk to the bottom of the bobber. Or you put the kid in the car, and you're driving somewhere, and they want to know how long until we get there. That type of patience. But and kids are going to have a limited amount of patience, and that's okay. It's part, of, it's part of why they learn so much, because they only have so much patience for one thing, so they're, they're constantly taking in new information. That's a good thing. And we have to understand and, and have some limits with how much patience we expect a child to have. However, we've gotten into a place today where it's, it's a way different scenario, isn't it? Everything is instant and on demand. And that's okay to a degree. But it was, makes me think of when I was a kid, little kid, my Italian grandmother, the one in Florida that I mentioned earlier. We went to a diner she worked at, and she asked me if I wanted a piece of apple pie. I said, yeah. So she pulls it out of the little thing that spins around. It's all cold in there, you know, so it's ice cold. And I'm going to eat cold pie. I don't care. It's a kid. I'm a kid. You're giving me apple pie. I'm, I'm good. She says, would you like it warmed up? And I said, uh, yeah, sure. I, how long will it take? Because I'm not patient. She goes, oh, not long. She walks back to this thing, sticks it in this big silver box. And in like 25 seconds, she puts it on my plate. It's steaming hot. I had never seen a microwave oven. I was like, oh, my God, what is that thing? And she explained it to me. And I was blown away by it. The kid today would want to know why it took 25 seconds. Because everything's on demand. Everything's on an iPad or mommy's phone or the computer or the TV. And it's on demand when we want it. I remember when I first got into, you know, streaming music and and found things like, uh, what the hell was it called? LimeWire when you were stealing music. I did it. I'll admit it. And uh, I, I ended up with like thousands of songs that I, I love from the past all on one device that I could listen to and I, I wasn't ever finishing a song before I was jumping to another song and, ju- and this is how our children are growing up I was doing this as a grown man in my early 30s that's how old that is right um, but our kids are growing up with this from day one they have no patience so the problem with that isn't just the in general problems we think of but they want what they want now, including things like satisfaction. 
a sense of purpose. You, you see, a friend, a boyfriend, a good relationship. Even as they get older and they're now young adults, they want, they expect that everything comes quickly. The garden will slow you down. You put the corn seeds in, you want it to come up now, it's not happening. You come back in 10, 11, 12 days, the little sprout's there. You come back in two or three weeks, you have this little bitty plant. If you step on it, you killed it. You got to take care of it. You come back in four or five weeks, you've got this, you know, thing is a couple feet tall. You come back in 90 to 120 days, you have this plant that's taller than your daddy. And this big thing of corn is on it. But sometimes it's still not ready. And you have to learn that little tassel thing has to try. And then you pull this thing off. And then you have this thing that you're used to. Dad just goes to the grocery store. Mom just goes to the grocery store and gets it. Somebody opens a bag and dumps it out. And there it is. This is what it actually takes to have that. That lesson alone could cause a trophic cascade. Absolutely. If our children can just learn the value of patience, how big of a difference does that create in our society as a whole? How about you learn that actions have consequences? If you take care of that plant, whether it's corn or squash or a tomato or whatever, for that period of time, you get that result. If you neglect it, it dies. If you don't take care of it, it dies. Or it doesn't do well. If you look at, you've been given responsibilities as a child for this one plot, and dad has the rest, and dad's is all booming, and yours is sad because dad was willing to let you fail. You just learned about the consequences of actions and inactions. And if you do a good job and it grows really good, maybe even better than dad's did, because dad gave you a little plot that you could manage even better. You have more time than dad because that is a job. You learn that positive actions have consequences. Our kids are doing so much today. Because they do not see the consequences of their actions. Our kids are failing to do so many things today because they do not see the consequences of their inaction. And it's not just the general way that children lack that ability and have to learn it with maturity. It's a, a systemic thing. The entire concept, like when you were a kid, you probably made some stupid decisions because you didn't see how those consequences would come down later down the road. Or you probably didn't do some things that you'd have been better off had you done them. But you, you really probably did understand the, the larger macro issue of, yes, my actions or inactions do have consequence. You blew it in this microcosm of that macro idea, even though you would have never explained it that way as a kid, and neither would have I. But we're children today are losing that macro. Hey, what I do matters, and what I don't do matters, and the things I do today are going to come back to me tomorrow either negatively or positively. You can't not learn that gardening because the plant doesn't care that you don't feel good about it. If you don't feel good about the fact that you're taking care of your garden because your dad is standing in your ass making you do it, the plant doesn't care that you don't feel good. You're still going to get a positive result. If you're angry because you're getting a negative result and you're not doing the work, you're still going to get a negative result. You either provide the fertility, the environment, the moisture, etc., the care, the weeding, etc., necessary to cultivate this plant, and it gives you what you're asking for, or it doesn't. Or sometimes even a pest can come along and screw it all up. No one cares about your feelings when we're talking about a tomato or a tomato hornworm. We can either pick that worm off and save that tomato plant. We can either increase the biodiversity so that uh, little parasitic wasps come and kill that worm, or we can ignore it and we will end up with everything that we worked for destroyed. You cannot garden and not learn about actions and consequences. It's impossible. So now, into our trophics cascade, we have taught our children patience and that actions have consequences. Still think we can't solve this problem by initiating some positive movement with a garden? How about this? They learn to feed themselves and others. How many of our children that, you, that, that, that end up depressed, whether they take their own lives or they just end up depressed and they don't really go anywhere, they don't really do anything, how many of them do you think have the, 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 the belief of, I'm really not able to take care of myself and others? I mean, look at, look at the problem that we have with the inability of our youth to do shit today. 
We have 34-year-olds who do laundry and go on Twitter and say they adulted because they did laundry at 34. And you think, well, maybe it was just a joke. Because sometimes I say that, too, as a joke. But then if you, like, look at their shit, you're like, really, like, that's the first time, 34 is the first time you did laundry in your life. It, see, so you think, well, you know, that's just an idiot, or their parents did drop the ball away. But no, see, it's not, hey, here's how to do laundry. Hey, here's how to do this. Hey, here's how to do that. Here's how to do this other thing. It's teaching someone, hey, you can have a positive impact on your own life. You can feed yourself. If you can feed yourself, you can freaking do anything. You teach a, t a kid to grow food, they're going to want to learn how to cook it. So they're going to learn that life skill. Do well, then it's like cook, they're going to mess stuff up, so they're going to have to do dishes. Right? All this adulting shit that people are waiting until they're in their mid to late you know, 20s or even early 30s to do, yeah, all gets done right here. You're going to grow food, you're going to cook it. See how simple this is, really. And you can feed others. The greatest way to put value into a person's soul, into their spirit, into their psyche, however you want to define it for yourself, whatever word works for you, is to make them realize that they have value to others. And I don't know anything that really puts a, a, a greater feeling like that in a person than to say, hey, here's some food. I grew this for you. When I was a kid, I talked about my grandfather's garden. And even before we moved to Pennsylvania, this was the case, because I spent most of my summers up there. As we started to get the bigger harvests in, it was more food than we could use. It, it really was. And it was more than my grandmother wanted to put up or can or what have you. I mean, we grew more than we needed. And she would take vegetables, a couple peppers, a couple zucchini plants, you know, some, some cucumbers, and maybe even a jar of leftovers that we didn't use from last year, or some chow chow. And she'd make up these bags, and she might make up four or five bags, and she'd write names on them. And one of the names was Debsky. One of the names was Wastitian. One of the names was Kachmer. And one of the names was Schaefer. And I still remember those names, and I remember those people, and I remember them because they were older people. And she'd just go, you know what to do. Not, hey, I need you to do this when you get it. No, you know what to do. <laughs> Tell you what, when your Ukrainian grandmother, who is about five foot four, but a whirlwind of energy even her, in her 60s and 70s, tells you, you know what you're going to do, you go do it. And I would take those bags of food to these family members. One of them was a, the Debsky family was a family that came over at the same time my great-grandparents came over from the Ukraine. They lived in the same uh, village. They actually came t via Romania. The Wastitian, my grandmother's maiden name was Wastitian. The Wastitian family, that was my great uncle. And Schaefer was just a, a, an older couple that lived up on the hill that they called Schaefer's Hill, by the way. And I would take on foot as a kid. And I would say the first time I did that, I was probably 10 years old. When you... Realize that you have that kind of a, an ability to actually impact a person's life by feeding them. You have self-worth. So now we've taught our children patience. Actions have consequences. And the self-worth of being able to feed others. Do you think we can start our way toward a, a trophic cascade? How about this? They learn to recognize patterns. When you go into a garden and there's a plant missing from a row and they're all planted 18 inches apart. And I'm not even saying that's the best way to do it. But you just you do that. Do you not immediately go, hey, something wrong there? You go and every day the plants looked a certain way and today they don't quite look that way. You don't go, oh, wait, something's, something's up. Either bad or, or, you know, do they look better or they look worse? What's going on? You learn about growing beans and you see what a bean looks like and then you see another plant that's a different type of bean that looks different but has a similar shape and structure. You go, oh, that's a bean of some sort. I wonder what that is. You identify patterns. You see there's bugs on your squash and they're starting to damage it and you turn it upside down and you see these little, little red eggs in a unique pattern that they form. And you learn that connection. You cut open a, a bunch of celery and you see a pattern inside of it. We can't not see pattern as human beings. We, we, are, we are geared to see patterns. That's why when there's a light switch with four switches in it and all the lights are off and three of them are down and one is up, it bugs you a little bit. That's because we see pattern. Now, how much of our problems 
shows us itself in a pattern before it happens. An individual who's troubled, you see their pattern of behavior. Government seeking to control a population uses a pattern, a recognizable pattern. Everything around us is in pattern. And once we learn the ability to recognize those patterns, those patterns of behavior, those patterns of problem, those problems or those patterns that are positive, or those patterns in nature that help us identify something, we can't unsee it. And it's something I've heard from many of you who have taken permaculture design courses and really got into the design science. And then you're like, holy crap, every time there's a news story, I see the pattern. Even though they seem unrelated, I, I get it now. That's what you learn in a garden. You learn that pattern recognition. So now we teach our children patience. Actions have consequences. How to feed themselves and others and have self-worth from that. And how to recognize patterns. Are we even a little bit close yet to the belief that we could create a trophic cascade if we did this on a large scale? How about this? They learn to solve problems. When you have a garden, I'm back to what I was saying earlier, and you have a plant that's not growing well, you can cry about it. You can tell it that you feel like you identify as a male or a female instead of how you were born. You can sit there and tell it that it's not fair. You can go tell your mom that you're upset about it. You can tell your friend that you're upset about it. But until you figure out what's causing that plant to grow poorly and take a corrective action, that plant will continue to grow poorly and even die. There's no cheat code you can look up on the internet. You can go dial in you know, star 379 and it will grow well. You will have to find out what's wrong, and you will have to fix that problem. How many of our problems in our children today are a direct result of their inability to problem solve? Because they don't learn to problem solve in school. They learn to emulate and regurgitate. Even when you think like the most problem solving thing in the world is math, they learn a mathematical method that if they stray from the method and still get the right answer, they get marked wrong. Now that doesn't make any sense because you haven't actually learned to problem solve then. You've learned to follow a formula. You've learned if I turn this crank this way, it makes this thing go that way and it makes things come out of that chute over there. So now I'm qualified to work in the industrial age that doesn't exist anymore. Yay! But then the first time you turn it and it locks up, what do you say? I need somebody to fix it for me. I don't fix it. I turn it. And yet it's a bit broader than that, but I'm trying to drill it down to the, the thought process. This is why you see a kid today you know, do something and it not work, and they grab their head like, like, like they just killed somebody. I see this with my, my farmhand often. Because they don't have in, in this innate concept of when something's not working, all I need to do is look at how it works. What does it need? What is it missing? What is it lacking? And I'll fix it. I mean, there's a lot of things other than gardening to teach that. When you grow up, in the 70s and 80s and the 60s, and you were a young boy, you probably helped fix cars. If you got a dirt bike, you had to fix your own dirt bike, things like that. So you learn like this basic concept. It breaks, I fix it. Well, the garden gives you that in spades, especially when you first start. My pepper plants are yellow. Well, why are they yellow? Well, you probably just went, well, they're probably, of all things, lacking mostly nitrogen. But what if you didn't know that? I mean, it's solution simple, isn't it? If it's just, you know, they're little, the leaves are like a little lackluster in their color and they're lacking some nitrogen, we get some supplemental bioavailable nitrogen and give it to the pepper plant. Well, if you're teaching your kid to garden and he has pepper plants with yellow leaves and he's not happy about it, you might point him out so he even knows that's a problem because maybe he, doesn't, he hasn't developed pattern recognition yet. It's supposed to be bright green. Well, if you just go throw some nitrogen on there for him and it fixes it, that doesn't do anything. Well, let's learn about it. What, is, what, is the, what are the three primary nutrients our plants need? Boring. Well, I don't care. Your pepper plant's going to die if you don't learn this. So we're going to learn that together now. All right? See how simple that is? Eventually, they'll want to do it. And then once they learn to do it, and then they take it, and they put it, make them do it themselves. A four-year-old can dump some nitrogen-rich fertilizer on a pepper plant. So your eight-year-old can definitely pull it off. Get them to do it. Teach it. Well, now it's there. It's a solid fertilizer. How's it going to get down to the roots? You water it in, right? Teach them how to do that. And that starts to set the stage for, hey, when something doesn't work the way it's supposed to work, there's probably something I can do to fix it. Now, I may get to a point where there is nothing I can do. It's beyond my capability. 
but I should at least determine that before I pass it along. So now, in our attempt to create a trophic cascade in our children, just by teaching them to garden, we've taught them to learn patience, that actions have consequences, how to feed themselves and others, how to recognize problems, and how to solve, uh, recognize patterns, and how to solve problems. Gee, you think maybe if a few wild dogs can change the course of a river, this might change the course of a generation? How about this? They learn the value of hard work. I mean, we're moving into a society that completely devalues hard work. What do you tell kids today to get them to study hard? See that guy over there on the street with a shovel? You don't want to be like him, do you? You need a college degree. or you didn't, so That's a lie. But I mean, even just think about the overriding message. To get your hands dirty is beneath you. And there's a part of our soul that, that involves being what we are innately human. And humans are meant to touch the soil. We were, when, when we started out as a species, we had no shoes. We had no clothes. We walked on bare soil. We touched bare soil. We smelled bare soil. Our survival depended on, there was a mark in the soil that was something to eat. There was a mark in the soil that represented danger. There was a mark in the soil that represented there's water here. There was a mark in the soil that represented don't come here. You can't just take that away from a species and expect the species to be healthy. You need some contact with these things. And this comes through real work. I'm not talking about working to complete exhaustion, but I'm talking about doing something to the point where a little bit of perspiration comes out and there's a purpose to it that, you, that actually means something to you. Like, there'll be food at the end of the day because of this. Because what happens is we take a kid that's not really athletic and we make him run around a circle. And you think we're learning something about physical activity. You know what that kid thinks? This is the stupidest thing in the world. And I'm not going to do this anymore as soon as I don't have to. Because what is the result he's going to get? He's not athletic. The, the, the fast kids are still going to be faster than him. The endurance runners are still going to run further than him. He's never going to be the best at it because he's just not genetically predisposed to be so. What is his result? What is his reward? Not being yelled at, not having to do push-ups, which is also... You see what I'm... What is the purpose of a push-up? It's physical conditioning. No, it's destroying your rotator cuffs. But it's easy and doesn't require any equipment, so let's make them do that. Like, what, what, is, what do they get from this? If they want to play sports and, there's a, and they have the ability to do so, and it's conditioning and it allows them to do what they want, then it works for that group of children. But it certainly isn't universal. It doesn't work for everybody. But when you do work and you come in and you're a little bit tired... And you had to fix a problem or two along the way. And you look out and there's something concrete, something real on the other end of it. Then it starts to matter and you start to realize there is a purpose in activity. So, we've taught our children patience, actions have consequences to feed themselves and others, recognize patterns, solve problems, and value hard work, all by growing a couple gardens. Hmm. They also learn that all living things have a place in our world. They will experience pest pressure. And you will be able to explain that if we just eradicate them with seven dust, then more will come. And the animals that eat them will never come. And they will never learn that that bad bug had a purpose, which was to feed the good bug. And you tell me that some of the problems we have today do not stem from a lack of the value of life, of human life. We don't value the lives of other human beings enough. If you can learn to see a shred of value in the life of an insect, you can't help but see more value in the life of a human being. And my God, but some of our problems are because of the lack of the value of life. When we value something, when we really value something, we treasure it, we preserve it, we protect it, we maintain it. What happens when you devalue something? You ignore it. You destroy it. You don't care if harm comes to it. When you learn about gardening, you learn the value of life. You learn to value that food that tastes better than anything you can get in a store. And you realize it came from a living system. And they're not going to understand every bit of this at that time. What we're talking about is that trophic cascade, planting that seed. 
that grows. And we have to have patience and give it time to. So now, through using gardening, we've been able to teach children patience, their actions have consequences, to feed themselves and others, to recognize patterns, to solve problems, the value of hard work, and that all living things have a place in our world and all life has value. I'm, I'm just thinking that maybe Jeff Lawton's claim isn't so crazy after all. We also learn that everything in life is a cycle. An annual plant grows, it produces, and it dies. And it, in many instances, the plant produces far more something than is edible. Look at a corn plant. Uh, uh, some species of corn, some varieties of corn, I should say, might be six or eight or nine or ten feet tall and produce two or three, in some cases, four or five ears of corn. There's huge stalks left behind. Think of a sunflower, a mammoth sunflower. The stalk is big around as your arm. 12 feet tall. Flower about the size of a big plate. A little bit smaller center, full of seeds. The entire rest of that plant, after those seeds are harvested, what is there? Think of a squash plant. It might go three or four feet in diameter. Just a bush squash plant, like a zucchini. As long as the bugs don't get it, right? Produce a bunch of zucchini. If you're in the right climate, you'd be throwing them in people's car. But at the end of the season, there's this huge plant. It's an annual it doesn't live through the cycle. It dies. What do we do with it? Do we discard it? Do we devalue its life that it gave? Do we take it and we compost it? And then we learn about a nutrient cycle. And we learn that there is a cycle to these systems. Or a perennial that grows and seems to die. But if we value it, we put it in the right place, we put it in the right climate, mulch it, whatever it is we need to do for it, prune it. Next year, as the seasons turn, the buds break, the flowers come out, and it becomes more powerful than it was before. See, these cycles show a continuity to life that our children are completely disconnected from. They're not able to see these cyclical events. So that's why your 15-year-old daughter thinks it's the end of the world that some boy doesn't like her completely ridiculous but if you can understand the eternal nature of cycles and that time goes on and that things will change and things will shift a little bit easier to deal with it won't make all the problems go away it won't make everything completely smooth and by the way trying to make everything completely smooth no bumps no annoyances no problems whatsoever for our kids is part of how we screwed them up so bad it's okay that they have knockdowns and bumps emotional and physical both you can't develop resiliency. Back in the 80s, they had a thing called the biosphere. It's a big, giant sphere. They put people that live in there. They put trees and plants, tried to make like an Eden for people to live in. And some of the trees grew beautifully huge and then fell over. They just fell over. I couldn't figure out why. There was no wind. There was no wind to temper them. They fell over on their own weight because they were never built resiliency because they never had to withstand the wind so wind's okay but you have to understand that there's a cycle that yes this is a winter in my life but there will be a spring and another winter then i can be resilient i understand i'm gonna have ups and downs i have had a shitty year guys it's gotten really good in the last two weeks by the way i didn't crawl up in the ball and lay on the floor because it sucked but many of our children, that's what they're doing because they've lost sight and they've never learned that everything in life runs in a cycle. Everything. You can't find anything in the world that doesn't run in some sort of a cycle. So, with gardening, we've taught our children to learn patience, that actions have consequences, to feed themselves and others and value that in themselves, to recognize patterns, to solve problems, the value of hard work, that all living things have a place in the world, and that everything in life has a cycle. <laughs> we also learn that there's some things beyond our control. We can do everything right, and some pests can come in and just lay waste, or some disease can come in and just lay waste to a certain crop. And no matter what you do, there may not be a way to fix it. Or the way to fix it may be something you don't want to ethically do. Like, I could fix this with a poison, but I'd rather just grow a different plant than fix this with a poison. Then you learn that you have the ability to make certain decisions, and sometimes that even is that this isn't going to work. And that's okay that it doesn't work. 
I won't grow a tomato this year, or I'll try, and when they die from blight, I'll switch over to tomatillos. It's an example. But there are things beyond your control, and there's the thing that our kids are so afraid to fail. They're afraid to fail. They're afraid to, lo- to, to have something go wrong. It's like the end of their world. Well, you're going to fail as a gardener, and you're going to learn to deal with it. And you're going to learn that, okay, so this failed, but these other 10 things worked really good, and these two things worked fantastic, and this one was like, eh, not really that great, but one failure, one eh, eight really good things, and two exceptional things. Well, this is okay. I just, I, I, I can't fix this, and it's okay. And sometimes it'll be, you know, you could have a hailstorm wipe out your whole garden, and it's gone. And you lost everything you did. It might happen. Yeah, and sometimes in life, a person that we love dies and we can't fix it. It's much easier to learn that lesson with a garden. So if you have to deal with it in your real world life, you've already got that built into your morality and your resiliency. Because the last thing anybody that, that leaves us wants us to do is stop living. So they learn that there's some things beyond their control. So now, with a garden, we've taught them patience. Actions have consequences to feed themselves and others recognize patterns, solve problems, the value of hard work, that all living things have a place in our world, that everything in life is a cycle, and they learn that some things are beyond their control. They also learn to teach. You get a kid gardening, and that kid will be teaching you in a few weeks. Look what I did. Even if you know. like Teaching doesn't require that your student doesn't know. The skill itself is a skill. And all teaching is is the ability to look at something and describe how it works and explain how to repeat it. We can, we can, all teachers are heroes and all this nonsense, right? And say that we need a four-year degree to teach second grade. We can do all that bullshit. Or we can actually look at what teaching is and say concretely, this is what teaching is. Having sufficient understanding of a thing to explain it to someone who does not understand it so that they can absorb it and utilize it and or repeat it in a meaningful way. So I think much of what we call teaching today is not even teaching. When you get a kid to memorize 20 facts about history and get an A on a test, but next year, if you give them the same test, they'll fail it, you did not teach them. You did not teach them. You helped them to temporarily memorize some statements of fact. Or some opinion, depending on what school you're in. But when I was a kid, before I went in the Army, I was in delayed entry. Which is like, you get together with your recruiter and other guys that are going in, and guys that have recently been in and coming out, and maybe somebody's on leave, and you go do shit. Like, play paintball and stuff like that. Well, we went rappelling. And there was this guy, he was an Army Ranger... He was on leave. He was a good friend of one of the, the recruiters that recruited me. And he was, we were rappelling from a 189-foot high bridge in a place called Hometown, Pennsylvania. And we're doing a, tying a Swiss seat. And he shows me how to do it. And I follow him and I do it. And he says, yeah, that's good. He fixes it a little bit, take it off. He shows me how to do it a second time. Then he says, we'll take it off. He says, now you teach me how to do it. You teach me. Now, this guy is an Army Ranger. I'm a 17-year-old kid that's never done this before. I've done it twice. I'm teaching him. So I teach it to him. And he does it as I do it. He doesn't get ahead of me to help me. If you want me to tie a Swiss seat for you today, I haven't done one in 15 years. I can do it. He taught me. I actually learned. The fact that I can still do it means that I learned. If you have not done that, you haven't learned. And how did he teach me? By teaching me how to teach him. The most powerful method to learn something in the world is to teach it to somebody else. Our children learn that in a garden. They learn how to teach others. So when they learn a valuable concept, they develop the ability to pass it on. Wow, that's actually the definition of teaching. To be able to learn something of value and be able to pass it on so that others can use it too. There's your definition of being a real teacher. If it has no value, getting somebody else to do it is not teaching it, it's training them. See, to train an organism is to condition it so that it cannot behave differently or will behave as a certain way for a time. 
I train my dog. I can train a tree. I can train a plant. I can train a child. Or we can teach a child. And the best way to teach them is by enabling them to learn how to teach. To acquire value in knowledge. And pass it on so it can be utilized by somebody else. Pretty interesting, huh? Children have learned patience. Actions have consequences to feed themselves and others. Recognize patterns, solve problems, value of hard work. Uh, that all living things have a place in the world. That everything in life is a cycle. That some things are beyond our control and they learn how to teach. They also learn how to find answers from elders and literature, etc. So it's one thing to be able to look at a thing and figure out what's wrong with it. And figure out what to do about it. That's great. That's troubleshooting. That's kind of what we've been talking to mostly in that field up till about now. But there's a point where you realize that you this is beyond your control for the moment. So there's things that are completely beyond your control. Some animal came and ate all the food. A deer came and ate your lettuce patch to the ground. There's nothing left that's not going to grow back. We can do something about making the deer not do it again, like wire and a little electricity and some... Tin foil and some peanut butter. But since we didn't do that, did, what has happened is now beyond your control. But if there's something not quite right and it's not totally lost yet, even if we've exhausted all of our knowledge and all of our thinking and all of our ability, somebody's seen this before. Somebody knows. Whether it's a web search or a book or going to an old lady and saying, Hey, Mrs. Smith, this is what my tomatoes look like. She goes, Oh, here's your problem. Which was the way we did it all the time when I was a kid. There was no internet. You couldn't afford a damn book. You went to the library. It was like two on gardening. And they were like 50 years old and half the pages were missing out of them. So you went to an old person and said, hey, this isn't working. What do I do? And then they learn to find those answers even when they don't have the ability to readily acquire them just on the fly. And you know what? They learn a hundred more things. They learn a hundred more things. Some big, broad concepts like I tried to keep it today, some very specific, like the nitrogen cycle, like the NPK ratio and what that means, like companion planting, like the legumes fix nitrogen, botany, right? They learn about insects. I mean, you can get into a million different things you learn, genetics, from seed saving. If you want to do that, here's how we make sure two plants cross, and here's how we prevent two plants from crossing. It's a hell of a lot better than making friggin' Mendel squares in friggin' eighth grade biology about pea blossoms that you don't give a shit about because you've never seen one. So, so there's a million more things they learn, but in these, this macro level, think about the trophic cascade in society that if we went on a mission to teach our children through all possible avenues we can gain community gardens and churches programs in schools there's somebody out there that can take this concept create a school gardening level curriculum and get administrators to accept it and put it into hundreds of schools one person can do that and one person probably will and there's people like me I can't do that I will get in a fight with those people. We cannot work together. I don't have the personality for it. I'll admit it. Some things are beyond my control. I learned that from my grandfather when we were growing tomato plants in Pennsylvania when I was 12 years old. I've accepted that since then. I accept who and what I am now. And gee, that might be a good thing for our children to be able to do too. These are the things I'm really good at. These are the things I'm okay at. These are the things I'm passable at. And these are the things that I suck at. And some of the things that I suck at are intrinsic to who I am, and I'm always going to suck at them. And some of them, if I want it bad enough, I can become excellent at them. And some of them, I could become excellent, but that's not me. That's not my passion. That's not my life. These are the things that are good, that I can do, that I want to do. And there's a place for me, and there's a cycle. And even though I don't fit in perfectly today, it's all the people that didn't fit in in school that rule the freaking world today. I mean, really think about it. The people that were the, 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 the square pegs, that they tried to drive us into the round hole. Some of us didn't fit in because we just rebelled against the system, even though we got along with our peers just fine. Some of them had problems with peers and being bullied and things like that. But the people that got through it, from my generation and the generation before, we rule the world. All the people that didn't understand us work for us today. 
Because it runs in cycles. And you're, you take a system where everybody's judged on the same parameters, like school. But the real world's based on a bazillion different talents and parameters. And the child that doesn't understand that this is just something I get through. That the opportunities pass this. And that's where I can grab onto the things that I'm really great at and the things I'm okay at. And even some of the things I think suck, if I have to do those for a time to create an opportunity for myself, I have the patience. And I know that my actions have consequences. And since I can feed myself, I'm not going to starve. And since I recognize patterns, I'll be able to see the opportunity when it comes. And since I can solve problems when it doesn't work, I'll figure out what to do. And since I value hard work in myself, I'll put the effort in so that all of these things can happen. And I know that all living things have a place in our world, so I'll be compassionate along the way where I can. And everything comes in a cycle, so my time will come if I continue to strive for it. And some things are beyond my control, and I will have to learn what to live with them. But since I can teach others, I'll be able to find a place for myself. And since I can always find answers from elders, from literatures, from community, since there's always an answer to every question, even the things that I cannot fully control, I can mitigate, I can change, I can learn from, and I can build upon. And some of those things I don't think I have control over, I will find in the end that I have control enough to make them better. Trophic cascade much? And this is why when someone makes a statement that seems completely radical, that seems completely upside down on its head, that doesn't seem to make any sense at all, that seems to look at the problems and, and, and basically not even accept the problem because it's so ridiculous, we can solve all the world's problems in a garden. That sometimes that's the person we most need to listen to. Because... This is the core of life itself. And that's what our children are missing. The core of the value of life itself. Things take time to occur. What we do matters. Being able to take care of ourselves is critical to being able to take care of others. The things we've seen before can help us when we see them again. And we will see them again. And sometimes they don't even seem related, but they are. And when something goes wrong, we can fix it. At least we can fix our piece of it. Everybody has a place. It's not right for me to shove another person into the place I think they belong, though. I have to accept what their place is. And they need to accept mine. Everything. Everything has a purpose and a time and a place and a season. There are some things that will just happen and there's nothing I can do about it. But as long as I can learn and help others learn, I'll be able to find answers. And I just gave you those same points again in different words. And it all comes from that one seed that is the garden. And why do you think the story of creation... Why do you think the story of creation across multiple faiths, no matter what you believe or do not believe, it always starts on some level in a garden. Well, folks, that's all I've got for you today. That's all I have. I hope some of you will take it and run with it. And it won't matter if it's just your niece or your nephew that you plant a few beans with, or if you're that person that gets a program like this into 100 schools. All it took was a few wild dogs to change the course of a river. A few renegade gardeners just might be able to change the course of society.